Hi everyone, my name is Quaid. <laughs> Hi, I'm a, I'm a computation biology researcher. I've had my lab for about 10 years now. Um, we do a lot, my training is in machine learning and computer science and also biology. Uh, we do a lot of methodolo methodological development. I'm trained in statistics as well. And I developed the algorithm that I'm going to talk to you about tomorrow called the G-Mania inference algorithm. And Gary and I collectively developed the interface. Um, I've been working in this field for a long time and I've been teaching this class about six years. Um, great. And so what I'm going to teach you uh, about today is, uh, is finding overrepresented pathways in gene lists or gene set enrichment analysis. And what's going to be important, what I'm, trying to, I'm going to be trying to convey to you is some of the concepts. And you know, we're not going to go deeply into the math, obviously, but, but we're going to, I, I want you to understand intuitively what the concepts are and what the statistics are trying to do. And the reason this is important is there are tools that you can use to do these, uh, to do these enrichment analyses, but they change all the time. Sometimes the, the tools themselves aren't perfect, and sometimes interpreting the output of the tools needs you to be able to understand how the, uh, the calculations were done in the first place, right? And some of the issues that can appear uh, that you, uh, that when you, when you use these tools. So let's just jump straight into it. Um, and so we have a list of learning objectives here. I feel a little bit uncomfortable because I, I usually like to point at things and then we have two screens here and I can't really do that. I guess that doesn't work, right? Um, maybe if I have, oh good, okay, I have a mouse. All right, and so what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about two different ways to do enrichment analysis. One is using something where you have just a gene list and Gary's talked about various ways of coming up with gene lists, and we're, I'm going to talk to you a couple about a couple other ways that you might uh, do the analysis to come up with a gene list. But the other way of doing it is is uh, analyzing a ranked list of genes. So if you have some score that you can assign the genes, that you can rank them from time to top to bottom, say you know uh, upregulated to downregulated. There's a different series of tests that you can do on that rank list that in some cases gives you more information and also has more statistical power, so it can detect more, it's more sensitive, it can detect weaker signals. The other thing, um, so that's what those two learning, so that's what these two learning objectives are. This is the, this is the gene list and this is the rank list. And then you're not just going to test enrichment against one pathway or I'm going to call pathways gene sets because I want to be more general because you might be testing things like, as Gary th said, like chromosomal position, and that's not necessarily a pathway, right? But uh, when you test for enrichment for gene sets, you're usually testing dozens or hundreds at the same time, right? And then when you do these p-value calculations, you have to correct for that fact. Um, and I'll explain why you need to correct for that during this talk and justify that to you. But the way in which you do that correction is something called a multiple test correction. And we're going to talk about the two major multiple test corrections. These are the only two ones you need to know. These are the ones that everybody uses. Um, and so you want to, going to be, want to be able to select between these two types of corrections. The one's called a Bonferroni correction. The other one's called a false discovery correction. And then I'm just going to explain to you in very plain language how you calculate these things. These corrections are actually really easy to calculate. And I'm just doing that because actually in some of the tools that you're going to be using, especially if you're working with a non-monal organism, that you're, those, that's not going to be built in for you. That you might actually have to do that yourself. Okay. All right. And so going through learning objectives, we've also gone through the outline. Um, so the two rank-based tests I'm going to tell you about are GSCA and the minimum hypergeometric test, in case you've heard about either of those two things. Maybe this will, like stimulate your knowledge uh, so that you know what to look for. Okay, and so as I said, there are two types of uh, enrichment analysis, and I'll repeat this again, I guess. And the first one is the gene list. So are any gene sets, wherever you see gene set, you can just put pathway in, in your mind. Are the pathways surprisingly enriched or depleted in the genes, uh, gene list? And there's one statistical test for this. And it's called Fisher's exact test. Sometimes people also call it the hypergeometric test. This is the only one. It's the only thing you ever need to learn about this. Other people have used other different statistical tests to do this type of analysis, but that was in the old days when computers were slow and you had to approximate the test. Now you can do the, the exact test. And there's no reason to use approximations anymore because computers are fast enough to do this. Okay, and then now, when you go to rank list, say uh, in the example I gave us, you have differential expression upregulated or downregulated in response to your perturbation. The, the, the question you ask is slightly different. Are any gene sets? Remember, that means pathway. 
ranked surprisingly high or low in my ranked list of genes? Do they occur at the top or, the, or down? Is, are these, is pathway in general upregulated or downregulated? Okay, and now, now there's a lot of statistical tests for this. And really, there is kind of, they're basically doing similar things. Um, there's just small technical differences between them. These are the types of things that statisticians argue about, but from the point at which we're at the level that we're going to be looking at, we don't really need to understand these differences in, in great detail, because I mean, essentially they're the same thing. Okay. okay, so here's the enrichment test, and then we always like to use expression as the, uh, as the example, because everybody kind of comes from a background where they, where they know about microarrays, right? This is kind of the common language now when people do genomics, is they think about microarrays even though no one, any, uh, no one uses them anymore. Okay, so you have, some, you have some experiment, and then in this case we're going to say it's a microarray experiment, we've done some sort of perturbation, and then you have a gene expression table in response to your perturbation, and you want to ask the question, use that gene expression table to define a gene list. These are the set of genes you're interested in that have uh, acted in a surprising way or, or have responded to whatever you're doing. Now the question is, what can I say about this list of genes? And the way that you do that is you take a set of genes, uh, database of gene sets, these pathways, but also other things, and you compare it to your gene list, look at the overlap, and come up with an enrichment table which has the name of the pathway or gene set here, along with uh, a p-value associated with that enrichment. Okay, so here's the details, given the list. Here I just chose five yeast genes. Um, are there any gene sets or annotations that are, that are surprisingly enriched in this set of five genes compared to some background that you're going to define? And how you define the background is important, and we're going to discuss that uh, in a minute, but just think it, that, that always when you're asking enrichment, you're asking enrichment against a background. You know, is this gene set surprisingly enriched for, you know, genes involved in ribosomal biogenesis compared to the background of all genes expressed under these conditions, for example? So whenever you do this enrichment test, think in the back of your mind, compared to the background of, and then you fill in what that background is, okay? So the details are where did the gene list come from, and I want to take a few minutes just to talk about that. Also, how to su uh, assess surprisingly. So when I say, are these annotations surprisingly enriched, how do you assess that? Well, that's the statistics. Those are the p-values. And then how to correct for repeating the test, and we're going to talk about that in the second half of my presentation, not right now. Okay, so the standard way of coming up with a gene list is just a two-class two design, right? So imagine this is like you know, case versus control, or wild type versus mutant, or like normal, and this is perturbed, and you're asking, and then you look at, in this case, differential expression, it could be differential methylation, it could be differential expression as measured at the proteomic level, it could be uh, a number of other ways of measuring differences between set uh, genes under two conditions, and then you rank the genes by some differential dis statistic, you know. Is the mean expression level under the second condition higher than the others? How many full times higher is it? You know, maybe we're only going to consider something to be upregulated if its p-value is significant. You know, you have various different ways of coming up with these gene lists, and we're, um, we're going to suppose that you, the, you themselves have made that decision because it varies a lot by how you're measuring expression and what your questions are. Now, once you have the gene list, what do you do? Okay. So you can threshold by this differential statistic to define a set of genes that are upregulated in, in response to your perturbation or downregulated, or maybe you can just combine these two things together and say this is a set of genes that are differentially regulated, right? Those are all valid gene lists that you can come up with. Another way of coming up with a gene list is like using a time course design. So say you have some, you know, measure, maybe you're looking at like differentiation of stem cells or something. Um, so you, you measure expression or whatever you're measuring under different conditions, and then you get, for each gene, you have uh, a path through this time course. Like, a, you know, you see the time course, you see it go up in expression, you go down in expression, maybe it comes up in expression again. And then one way that you can use this information to come up with a gene list, you just cluster things. You use like a clustering algorithm like k-means or k-medioids, and there's various methods like this within the literature that you're probably familiar with. If you just look up clustering gene expression, you'll get, uh, you'll get access to a lot of these things. And then each one of the clusters can become a gene set, oh, sorry, gene list. Yeah. Yeah. 
Would I do in the fold change? Yes, I would. Yeah, I would do it in the log fold change. Yeah. Um, the reason for log fold change is um, a lot of these clustering. So if you just do fold change, going up doesn't look the same as going down. When you go up tenfold, you go from like one to ten, but when you go down, you go from one to one tenth, which is pretty close to one. You know, ten is a lot further away from one than one tenth is. When you put log fold change, you go from like minus one, which is like the log the base ten of ten, to, uh, sorry, plus one to minus one. So going up and going down is the same. Does that make sense? That's why you use log fold change. Okay. So in, under these conditions, each one of these clusters becomes a separate gene list. And you can ask for enrichment within the cluster. And here, like an obvious background, would be enrichment in this cluster compared to genes in other clusters. Okay. All right. So now we've, uh, we've defined our gene list. Let's say these are genes that are upregulated above some like full change, and there's a significant difference in their expression. And we've defined our background. And now we're going to do the gene list enrichment test. Okay. And so here, the background is all genes on the array. And maybe this is the point at which I'm going to stop and say a few words about how to define your background. Um, defining your background is really important. So in the old days, when microarrays were first invented, there were microarrays, because they were expensive, there were microarrays, for example, that just contained spots for all genes expressed in the immune system. So if I took a random subset of those genes from that microarray and asked, are they enriched for immune function? Well, guess what? They're enriched for immune function. Because that's how that gene list was, that's how that background was selected in the first place. Right? So you have to, um, so when you're asking if is if there's a surprising enrichment for genes of a certain function, you need to know what your background is. And that enrichment has to be discernible above the background. Okay, now we'll go back and we'll return to this issue throughout uh, my presentation. And certainly ask me questions about this. Um, you know, when you do a proteomic assay, for example, you know, maybe you want to consider as a background proteins that you, you suspect that you actually will be able to detect because they're in higher enough abundance to be able to appear, for example, in like tandem mass spec. Right? Yeah. Yeah, so you probably only want to go for, like, let's say if you're doing a fossil protein, you'd only want to be comparing your background to your proteins identified by your pet plant in your assay. Precisely. Precisely. The, the way to define the background is to think to yourself, okay, what are all the genes that could have appeared on the gene list, given what I'm measuring, right? So like in, in your case, yes, if you don't have, if it doesn't have a, a phosphorus site, it's not going to show up, right? Yeah. No, right. But I, what I'm saying, like the enrichment of the phosphorus on particular proteins, only really do it for your experimental condition if you've identified that in the run or in another random fraction. Exactly. Yeah. So it also has to be expressed. Yeah. 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 Great. OK. So if this isn't clear, we're going to return to this issue, and then you can continue to ask me about it. Or also ask me about it offline, and I'll see if I have any good ideas about how to help you define a background. OK. So now you take your list and your background, and you compare it to the gene set. right? And then here, we've just done the little Venn diagram to show the overlap. Now, see, there's like, there can be some areas of the gene set that are neither on your list nor on your background. I mean, that's going to be obvious, right? Unless your background covers all the genes in the genome, some of the things can be annotated that actually aren't either in your gene list or in your background. Okay, but then you want to ask the question, given how much overlap there is of the gene set of this square here, is this overlap surprisingly large? Right? And so how do we assess that? Well, we assess that using a p-value. And what does the p-value here uh, rep represent? The p-value represents that the, the probability that the overlap that you see or, uh, is at least as large. Sorry, let me say this again. The p-value is the probability that um, you would see an overlap as big as you did or an overlap larger than that just by random sampling. Right? So if I was just going to, if I was just going to, for example, let's, if I was going to take the gene set and instead I was just going to randomly select genes from the background, what's the probability that the overlap I see with your gene list 
would be at least as large just by random sampling. That's what the p-value represents. So a p-value of 5% means only 5% of the time, if I was randomly sampling from your background, would I see an overlap at least as this large. Okay, and that's a way of me measuring surprisingly. Yeah? Sure. Uh, maybe the next slide does this. Okay. No, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come up later in the talk, but I'll just tell you now. It's uh, the number of genes that are both in your gene set and in your gene list. So the number of the genes list in that pathway. So for example, if there are 20 genes in your pathway that are in your background set, and you see 10 of them in your gene list, is that surprisingly big, given the size of your gene list and, uh, and the size of the gene set, or not? That's what, that's what we mean by overlap here. Okay. All right, so how do you do this? Uh, well, you've got to define your gene list and your background list. You have to uh, select your gene sets to test for enrichment. You have to run the enrichment test, correct it for multiple testing, interpret the enrichments, and publish. It's pretty straightforward. <laughs> the publishing bit might be a little bit less straightforward. Um, but, yeah. Okay. Uh, so now, um, if, if what you have is a gene list, you're done, right? And I'll just tell you what the test is, and I tell you how to do multiple test correction. You don't have to make any more decisions, because there's just the one test that you, can, uh, that you can do. You have to make a decision about what the threshold is, but after that, it's pretty straightforward what you should be doing. Now, if instead you want to use a rank list, so you have some way of, of assessing, like for in this case, like differential expression statistic, for example, or how much you believe uh, that, the, uh, the, that this gene should be part of the gene list. Then there's tests that look at the whole list at once and ask whether or not there's uh, enrichment near the top or near the bottom. Right? And the advantage of these tests is you don't have to choose a threshold. Right? And the thresholds can be kind of somewhat arbitrary. If you choose a threshold wrong, you, know, you might lack sensitivity. So meaning that you might, there might be a signal there that you can't detect because you chose the wrong threshold. It also removes this kind of arbitrariness from your analysis because you haven't had to choose a threshold. Right? And so, so if you could, did get different results at different threshold settings, well, that could be a bit problematic. Right? Whereas if you don't have to choose a threshold, then you aren't making an arbitrary choice in order to get your analysis to work out. And you know, usually if you don't, avoiding arbitrary choices in your research is the way you should try to go when you're doing um, comp, uh, when you're doing analysis, okay. Okay, and so here the idea is it basically the same, except now instead of having a gene list, you have to rank the genes in some way. Once you have that ranking, then you can apply one of the rank list tests, and the two we're going to talk about are the GSCA or the minimum hypergeometric test, and then it's exactly the same. You assess p-values and you correct the p-values if you need to. Okay, so the only difference here is that you rank your genes instead of choosing threshold. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you what the, now I've given you an overview and we're just going to talk about the theory. Okay, any questions about this part of the talk? Now we get into statistics. Okay, so now getting back to your question, what does this overlap mean? So here we have a gene list. There's five genes on that gene list and the background population and the background population contains 5,000 genes. 500 of them are black, 4,500 are red. Right? And we want to ask, is there more black balls on this gene list than we would expect if we were randomly sampling from this? Right? So if I just went in and pulled out five balls, how often would I see four ball black balls or more? Now, what percentage of the time, that's exactly what the p-value is. Okay? So everyone, whenever you mention p-values, people are asking what the null hypothesis is. What the null hypothesis is, is you have to tell people sometimes what random sampling means, like what question you're answering. Because you could be, for example, asking a different question. You could be asking, do I see more or less black balls than I would expect randomly sampling from this population? Right? And that's a different null hypothesis. Here the null hypothesis is I see more black balls than I would expect. More or less is called a two-tailed test. Okay? That's what it means when people say what the null hypothesis is. And so this, the test to assess this p-value is, is sometimes called the hypergeometric test, sometimes it's called Fisher's exact test. 
they're the same test. Okay, and so what do you do? Well, you use something called the hypergeometric function to compute the probability of getting zero black balls out of five, one black ball out of five, and so forth, all the way up to five black balls out of five. And then you sum four plus five, because it's four or more black balls. Right? If you want to know what this function is, it depends on the size of your background population, the number of black genes, the size of your gene list, and the number of black genes in your gene list. Right? And that's the overlap. So it just depends on these four numbers. You can go on Wikipedia, you can look up this function if you want to. You don't really need to, but this function is called the hypergeometric function. That's why it's called the hypergeometric test. And then you just sum over four and five because it's four black balls or more. Okay. And then that answer is the p-value. This is the null distribution. So the vast majority of times the tools do this for you. It's all under the hood. It doesn't really matter. Like, you don't need to know anything about this. Sometimes, if you're, like, if you're working in non-model organisms, like I said before, you, sometimes you have to do this yourself. And by doing it yourself, what you have to do is come up with what's called a 2 by 2 contingency table. And so what's the 2 by 2 contingency table? It just is a way that you can plug into whatever tool that's computing the p-value for you. How, what, how many genes are in the gene set and in the gene list? How many genes are in the gene set and on the gene list? You just lay out all the four different possibilities of being in the gene set and, and, and or being in the gene list. And it can extract from the, this table the numbers that it needs to compute the hypergeometric p-value. Okay. okay, so there's a couple of details. So, so far I've been saying you want to test for over-enrichment of black balls. In this, in this case, what I mean by black balls presence in the gene set. Uh, to test for under-enrichment of black balls, you can instead just test for over-enrichment of red balls. Right? So you can make it a depletion test by just saying, something, saying the opposite is the gene set. Um, you need to choose the background population appropriately. Right? So, and the, here the question is, uh, what are the genes that could have shown up on the gene list? Right? And the reason that's important is because, because you're using the background to say what the probability of randomly sampling a gene list that has this degree of overlap with the gene set like this many shared black balls, right? So, so all the genes that could have shown up in the gene set should be in your, in your background. But you do want to exclude genes that could have never shown up in your gene set because, for example, you're not even measuring their expression level, right? Yeah? So, so if you do uh, interaction, you do an IP or purification, uh, you know, why, why would you do that? Is it because you want to see what the background or is it the controls, negative controls? Um, you know, or... Well, I wouldn't use the negative controls because you're not going to get a lot of hits on your negative controls necessarily. You, can get a, you want a sizable set for your background. So, you know, if you're doing proteomics in that circumstance, you know, one way to do it is sometimes people uh, maintain these databases of all the proteins that have ever been detected to, do, uh, to interact with other proteins so that they are amenable to your assay, for example. Right? So, so the negative controls themselves are not always the best thing to use as the background because they don't have a lot of genes in them. They're not negative. They're genes that you could have selected. Right? So for example, your positives don't show up in your negative control list. Right? And you actually want your positives to be in the background set because they are some of the genes that you could have selected. Right? So the negative control, I mean, it's a, it's a way of measuring like the frequent flyers. These are the, 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 the proteins that are going to show up under all circumstances because either they're sticky or they're very abundant. Right? What you're not looking for is the frequent flyers. You're not looking to remove those. You're looking to say, okay, well, this is the set of proteins that could have shown up because, you know, they're cytoplasmic, right? Or, you know, they're being expressed in the cell type that I'm doing this, this interaction assay in, right? Or they're at, are, they're at sufficiently high abundance that I will be able to detect them through proteomics, even though they're not so highly abundant that I detect them in every proteomic assay I do. Set. 
you have to, yeah, you have to make a decision about what the background is. I mean, the other thing that you could do is you could be careful about the way in which you interpret your results. Right? So, you know, if you are having a lot of difficulty defining your background, I, I think the best thing to do is, is to think about what, a lot about what your background should be. But the other thing you could do is you could say, okay, well, you know, I've done this, uh, I've done this like test on my immunochip, and I see enrichment for immune function in for a sort of very broad way. Well, I'm not going to interpret that necessarily as anything because that's something that I could have detected given the background that I have. Right? So you have to, I mean, you have to be aware of this problem. And, you know, there are various ways of trying to solve it. My suggestion is to try to control, you know, do a good job of defining what your background is. But you could also do a good job of interpreting your enrichments so that you don't overinterpret them because you know that you could have seen some enrichments given the sort of the background that you're sampling from. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. More questions? Okay. All right. Like I said, you will sometimes see other enrichment tests. And I said sometimes people use binomial or chi-squared to do Fisher's exact tests. These are approximations to Fisher's exact tests. Right, and they're done because you know basically in the old days statisticians didn't have computers; they had to do everything with like tables and like writing stuff down. But uh, the reason Fisher's ex exact test is so computationally heavy is you have to sum over this entire tail, right? So in the in the example I gave you, you just had to sum four black balls and five black balls. But usually they're like you're summing from like 100 to 900, and you're doing a lot of kind of complicated computations. So. Uh, that's why these other tests were used sometimes to do what you can do with Fisher's exact test. With the ranked list, you, you have to make a choice. And there's like, you know, there are, you know, three, what is, how many are there here? Five major tests that people tend to use. We're teaching you the first two. These last two tests here, Wilcoxon Rank Sum and Man Whitney U test, they're actually the same test. They were independently discovered, given different names, and later on people realized it's the same test. So, and that test is like, does everybody know what t-test is? Okay, so if you want to know what the Man whitney u test is, is you take all your, you take your rank list, and instead of having the t, val whatever value you would use for the t-test, you use the rank instead of the actual value. So instead of having the differential expression, you replace the differential expression with the rank, and then you ask, uh, are the ranks assigned to the gene set significantly higher uh, is the average rank assigned to the gene set significantly higher, significantly lower than the background? That's what that test is. Okay, and that's called the Wilcoxon or Man Whitney U test. Now, the test we're going to teach you um, is along the lines of what's called a KS test or Kolmogorov Smirnov test. It's a great name. People can say Smirnov now because it's a vodka, right? But then Kolmogorov Smirnov, I mean, that's a bit hard for people, but people call it the KS test. And they're all variations of the simple KS test. And I'll, I'll show you how that variation works in a second. But the reason that we're teaching you this test and the people, people like this test better is that um, for the ones that are like t-tests, you can't, you, they have a hard time with some types of data. Right? So say you have like, um, say the gene set is either upregulated or downregulated. So like, you know, so if you imagine the like the differential test statistic, the there'd be like a single bell curve, which would be the background. But if you look at your gene set, there's one bell curve here, and then there's another bell curve there. Right? It's called a bimodal distribution, because there's two bell curves, because some of the genes are upregulated, some of the genes are downregulated. This, this, and this, they have the same mean. Right? Because here, the mean is kind of between the two. And here, the mean is just in the center. The, 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 uh, the Wilcoxon Man Whitney U test can't detect that, but the KS test can. And we're not teaching the KS test, we're teaching variations of it, but this, this is, you know, if you're talking to a statistician, you can tell them KS test and they'll know what you're talking about. Okay, so what's the hyper, minimum hypergeometric test? So this was introduced uh, in this paper here, uh, if you want to look it up. And, you know, the, the idea is really simple. So I taught you. Just now, how to, if you give me one gene list, how to compute enrichment and assign a p-value to that. So what you could do instead is you could say, okay, well, let's, let's do this hypergeometric test 
at every possible threshold that I could use to define the, uh, the gene list using my rank list. Right? And then we're going to take the minimum p-value and we're going to ask whether or not that's significantly different or not. Okay? That's what the minimum hypergeometric test is. Okay. And it turns out that this minimum hypergeometric test is, is also uh, intuitively equivalent to what's called the GSCA test. I'm assuming you've heard of GSCA because it's very widely known. It's a very widely known way of doing enrichment analysis. And so this is the way it ends up working. So you have a gene set here, and then you have a rank list. And these, these black lines, what they're meant to represent is the, these are represent, meant to represent genes from your background set that are in your rank list. And I'm ranking them from top to bottom here. Right? And then you take your gene set, and with dark red lines have indicated where the gene set genes show up in this ranked list. And then the question is, are these gene set genes, are the red lines, are they near the top or near the bottom of the, of, of the list? Or is their distribution in this list more or less random? Okay. okay. And so to assess that, you take a running total of something called the enrichment score. Okay. If you see, if you look at GS literature, uh, uh, um, uh, GCA, I don't know why I can't say this suddenly. If you look at the GSCA literature, um, they actually do call this as an enrichment score. Uh, for me, uh, to make this connection with the minimum hypergeometric test, I'll, I can also define the uh, enrichment score as the negative log p value of the hypergeometric test at that threshold. But basically, the way this enrichment score works is every time you come to a gene that's not in your gene set, that's not in your pathway, you go down a step. And every time you come to a gene that is in your pathway, you go up a step. Right? And so the alignment here is not perfect, but it's meant to be. And so like every time you hit a gene, you have a little you go up a little bit, and then you get a whole bunch of genes that aren't on the list, then you hit another gene that's on the it's this on the gene set, you go up a little bit, then you go down. So it's like it's coming like a running total of the number of genes that are in uh, that are in your gene set kind of divided or subtracted away all the genes that aren't in your gene set. Right? And so what, what will happen is as you get to the top, as you go up, you're seeing higher and higher enrichment of genes from your gene set in the list up until that point. Okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe I did something, but I didn't understand. You compare your gen list to what you say not. Okay, so, so in this case, we no longer have a genes list. We have a way of ranking the genes. Okay. And so now the genes are ranked from highest, like most, uh, like let's say, upregulated to downregulated. And so it's a different way of defining a gene list. It's, the, it's a way of defining a ranking of genes. And so normally what you would do when defining a gene list is you just choose a threshold here and you say, okay, everything above this line is my gene list. Now that you know, now we just have a rank, so there could be a bunch of different thresholds that you could choose, and then your gene list would be defined as everything from the left until that threshold. And so what the ES score is doing is it's a way of measuring enrichment as you step down that list choosing different thresholds. Right? And so as you when you when you find genes that aren't in your gene set, this enrichment goes down, obviously. When you find a gene that is in the gene set, the enrichment goes up. And so it goes down, 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 goes up, 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 and then maybe you reach the top here, and this is your most en enriched gene list. Okay. And so that's exactly what you do, is you say, okay, what? let's find the point at which the enrichment gets the largest. And we're going to define that, and in, in the GSCA literature, they call this the leading edge subset. This is like the best possible gene list that you can come up with, right? And we've discovered this best possible gene list by just by stepping down my rank genes uh, list of genes until I find one that gives me the best enrichment. Okay, and then the ES score at that point is called the ES score for that rank list. This sort of the maximum ES score. Okay. Now the question then becomes: Now we have this maximum ES score. Is this surprisingly large or not? Right? You could imagine that even if you have a randomly ranked list of genes, 
there's going to be some point at which you get the maximum possible enrichment. And because you're choosing the maximum possible enrichment, it's still going to be positive because you get to choose where you're going to do your cutoff. So even with a random list, you could choose what looks like a pretty good cutoff. So you've got to make sure that the maximum ES score that you get is actually surprisingly large compared to like random orderings of your genes or random permutations of your genes. And so how do you do that? Well, basically the way you do that in GSCA and also for the min minimum hypergeometric p-value is that you, you compute this max ES score with random orderings. So you take your ranked gene list and then you just randomly sort it, like randomly reorder it, recompute the maximum ES score, randomly order it again, recompute the maximum ES score, and do this again and again and again. And remember the p-value is the proportion of time you would see an enrichment score at least this large with random reorderings. So you, you compute that by just counting. Let's say I'm going to do it 100,000 times and only 10 of those times did I, did I get a maximum ES score at least as large. Well, my p-value is 10 divided by 100,000. Yeah. So the background list is actually this list right here. So the whole thing? The whole thing is the background. But how do you rank the background? Oh, uh, the background gets, uh, it's, uh, it's already included. So, so I've used two different meanings of background. Okay. Sometimes I've said you have a gene list and then you have a background. Um, what I want, what I should say is that the whole list is the background. So the things that appear in the gene list, and the things that didn't appear in the gene list, but that are in your background set. Mm -hmm. so, so when you rank your genes, you, you're ranking both your gene list and the background set at the same time. So the background's in your gene list. So in this, in this circumstance, actually, I've only have like, I put 401 genes. So like I have a, actually a pretty small background because I'm like taking this from like a genome of like, you know, 20,000 genes. Yeah. Okay, that, does that make sense? Okay, um, and just as a, because I like to be complete, if for a minimum hypergeometric p-value, you actually have another option. You can use a multiple test correction with the ES score, but we're not going to talk about that. Okay, so like I said, the way in which you, you compute the p-value in this circumstance is, is you just, you, you, you compute empirically. You, you sample randomly by randomly reordering your set, computing the ES score, making the distribution, and then counting the number of times that you get an ES score that's at least as large as the one you got with the real sorted ordering. And that's your empirical p-value. So I, I, you know, four out of 2,000 times, I got, uh, I got an ES score that was least as good as my real value. Okay. That's the way that these systems do it. There's one technical issue here that I had to be very clear on, is when you compute this p-value, you have to add one to the number of times you see a score at least as large. You have to include your real value as one of the ones that you've seen. Okay. Um, otherwise, you're going to get these p-values of zero. It could be the case that you're going to see it zero times because your ES score is that high. And that zero p-value doesn't really, it's not meaningful, right? Because it doesn't exist. Right, because there is at least one random ordering that gives you an ES score at least at least that large because you've seen it. Right, so you have to add one to this. And what does that mean? What that means is the p-value that you come up with is always going to be at least one over the number of times you've done the random reordering. So if you need a p-value that's uh, one in a thousand, you have to do a thousand reorderings. If you need a p-value that's 1 in 10,000, you have to do 10,000 reorderings, right? And the reason I make this point is that now when we go to the enrichment correcting for multiple tests, we do need very highly significant p-values, okay? Meaning that you're going to need p-values of that order. Um, and for that reason, um, when people use these kind of permutation-based, this GSCA, you never use the most stringent multiple test correction. You almost always use the less stringent multiple test correction. I'm going to tell you about this less stringent one. So don't use what's called the Bonferroni correction. Use what's called the false discovery rate correction. Okay.
and you'll know about that in a second. Okay. So here's some more GSEA examples. This is where you have enrichment at the top of the list. So here the blue lines are, so the, the shaded line here is the ranked gene list, and then the, the red lines show up where, yeah. Sorry, did someone have a question? No, okay. The red lines show up where the, the, um, uh, the gene set that's enriched and treated is. The blue lines are the gene set that's depleted and treated. So here, remember, so if your genes are enriched at the bottom of the list, this enrichment score plot goes, you, get, you go to a minimum instead of a maximum. So you're looking either for the maximum or minimum ES score. And this is what the, this is what the enrichment score plot can look like if your gene set's not enriched. Okay, okay yeah? The bigger your background, the better the chance of the P will be statistically valid. So you can somehow manipulate the outcome. So one out of 100 versus one out of 10,000 is not going to give you the same P. So um, uh, I think what you're referring to is the number of random permutations that you do. Yeah. yeah. Well, you should do as many random permutations as you can. Um, so, and, and you're not cheating by doing more random permutations, right? You're just, you're better approximating the p-value. So if you do like a thousand random permutations, the lowest p-value you can get is, is 10 to the minus 3, 1 over 1,000. That's a bound on your p-value. Your p-value can actually be smaller than that, but you're just not able to figure that out because you haven't done enough permutations. If you do 10,000 permutations, the smallest p-value you can get is 10 to the minus 4. It's, that's a bound. It doesn't mean that you're cheating by doing more permutations. You're just more accurately estimating what your p-value is. So that brings us back to my other question. So you don't want to use the background to reflect the negative control because you don't have enough samples. You so found your p-value could not go down to what it should be. So... Um, uh, but those are but those are different things. So the background set, or like what you the other genes that you add. So in the in the in the when you have like a thresholding to define a gene list, you're talking when you have a gene list, and then you add in the background, which is the the genes that are not in the gene list. You're defining that's the size of your background set, right? And you're saying that if you have a smaller one, you're not going to get as much significance as you have a bigger one. Uh, that's true, but that's not related to the idea of like the random reassortment, right? So, so what I'm what I was just talking about is the number of times you have to random reorder the set. Well, that doesn't that's independent of the size of the set itself. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, it's not completely independent. I mean, sure, if you have a set that's like uh, has 50 elements in it, there's only 50 factorial re 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 reordering. But 50 factorial is a really big number, right? So, so because it's such a big order or number, yes, there are there are fewer ways of reordering the set if you have uh, if you have 50 in it than if you have 100 in it. But you're never going to uh, you're never going to evaluate all 50 re, uh, 50 factorial reorderings. Yeah. So now I see what your connection was. Okay. Yeah. Right. Does that make sense? You're, yeah. Okay. Well, the full change is, use, is what you use to sort it. Yes. Um, and then, and then you know, basically the rank is uh, what the row number is in Excel. That is. Yeah. So next question is linked to that. So we're talking about having a big list, right? The yeah. The number of permutations will change according to the size of that list. Yeah. So I think you had a slide where you had the high, high express and then the lower one. And anything in the middle that didn't change, but that gene You, you can't do that because you're you're reducing the size of your background. So the, so you can't choose your background based on the outcome of your well. You can't really choose your background based on the outcome of your experiment, right? So so if you just if you 
So I don't think in that case you can remove the stuff that, that's not expressed. Unless the question you're asking is uh, upregulated versus downregulated. Right? And so if you're just asking upregulated versus downregulated, you could probably remove the stuff in the middle. As long as you're upregulated and downregulated sets were approximately the same size. I think that would be okay. More questions? Okay. Okay, so why do we have to talk about multiple test corrections? So the reason that we have to talk about multiple test corrections is there's a, there's a great way to win the p-value lottery, right? You want a significant p-value. Uh, if, if you want to get a p-value that's 10 to the minus 4, how do you do that? Well, um, you can just ra continue to, to take random draws out of this background population, right? And so if I have a p-value that says, you know, I expect one in every 10,000 of my random draws are going to, going to have this much overlap with the gene set. Well, if I do 10,000 random draws, I would expect one on average of those to have this type of enrichment, right? So you can win the p-value lottery by just like randomly redrawing. I mean, this is obvious, right? But what's less obvious is that, is that when you're testing different annotations or different gene sets, you are implicitly redrawing from this distribution. Okay? So you're cheating in a way. And for example, if I say that if I say that my p-value is 0.05, right? So you know only 5% of my random draws will have an enrichment at least this large. And if I do a thousand draws, if I test a thousand different gene sets or a thousand different annotations for a given gene list, I would expect 50 of them to have a p-value of less than 0.05, right? Because my p-value is 5%. So I expect 5% of the tests I do to have that enrichment at least as large, right? And so you want to correct for that. And the reason this is important is that when you're looking at annotations, you could be looking at thousands of annotations, right? Because, you know, you have some gene list. You want to know what's going on in this gene list. You, you can try everything. And as Gary said, there's, there's a lot of databases, a lot of different things you can look at. And so you've got to make sure that when you say, well, these 50 different annotations are enriched in my gene list, that you don't see those 50 just because you've done five, uh, 1,000 tests. You see those 50 because they actually are enriched in your gene list. Okay, and so, so multiple test corrections are ways of, of correcting for this fact. Okay. And so there's the easiest one in the world is called the bond Bonferroni correction. And how's the bond Bonferroni correction work? Well, you take your original p-value, and sometimes p people call this the nominal p-value, and you multiply it by the number of tests that you did, which is the number of gene sets you're looking at. So if your p-value is like 0.05 on the gene set, and you've done 1,000 tests, you multiply uh, that by 0.05, and you get 50. Your p-value is now 50, which is a bit weird. No, it's number of tests. Yeah. You, the, well, sorry, the number of tests are like, um, it's the number of gene sets you're looking at. So, like, if you're like, so if you say, I'm going to see which goal category is enriched in my gene list. You know, there are like 10,000 goal categories. So when you ask that question, which goal category is enriched in my gene list, you're asking 10,000 questions. And so in that case, M is 10,000. Right? So if you instead use something like Go Slim, like Gary talked about, which is like a summary of the Go annotations, then you're only asking 100 questions. You're saying, which of these 100 Go Slim categories is enriched in my gene list? And in that case, M would be 100. Does that make sense? Okay, so you multiply the original p-value by 100 in this case, and you get the corrected p-value. Okay, so p-value has got to be between 0 and 1. People know that, right? Um, so what happens when you get p-value 50? Well, it goes back to what I've been saying before. The p-value is a bound. The p-value you compute is a bound, an upper bound on your actual p-value. So when you say the p-value, corrected p-value is 50, that's saying uh, the corrected p-value is 50 or less. Right, which is fine, right? 
we know not only is it 50 or less, we know it's also one or less. But this is just, it's a bound. And the fact that you can get these really high p-values is telling you that the bond feroni correction, it's extremely conservative, right? Because it, it doesn't want to make any assumptions about anything, about how the categories might be related to one another or anything like that. It's the most conservative correction and it gives you what's called the family-wise error rate. Okay, so what does that mean? So remember I told you before, if you do a thousand tests and you correct and you're looking for a p-value of 0.05 or less, there's going to be 50 of them just by random chance on average that are going to have that p-value, right? Because that's 50 is 5% of a thousand. Okay, when you correct the p-value, when you do the bond for only corrected p-value of 0.05, that says that the probability that any one test is, is due to random chance is less than 5%. So you would expect zero on average in a thousand to be due to, to, due to random chance. Okay, that's called the family-wise error rate. That's like one or more tests. Okay. So now this is a problem, as, as I said, because it makes it very conservative, doesn't make any assumptions, you get a lot of false negatives. There are things that are going to be enriched in your list that you won't necessarily be able to detect because you've done this bond for only correction and you've taken a p-value which actually normally would be significant and made it insignificant. Okay, and especially when you're doing these genomic analyses and you're doing it with a lot of these different gene sets and a lot of the gene sets are connected to each other in some way, sometimes people are willing to accept a less stringent condition. In fact, not only sometimes, almost always people do something different. And that's called computing the false discovery rate or the q-value. And the q-value makes a very different promise about the, the false positives that you would expect in your enrichment tests, right? And what's different about the false discovery rate or the q-value is it makes a promise about the expected proportion of tests uh, uh, of your observed enrichments or reported enrichments that are due to random chance. Okay, so what do I mean by that? So if I, if I take, if I do a thousand tests, if I look at a thousand different gene sets, and then I, I, I say that 100 of them are enriched at a false discovery rate of 0.05, what that means is only 5% of the 100 on average will be false positives. So I'm saying that 95% of my, uh, my reported enrichments are real and 5% of them are wrong. I don't know which 5% of them if they are. I would just take them away if I knew which 5% of them there were. But on average, only 5% of them are wrong. Okay, so that's very different than the bond for correction. The bond for correction says, if I report 100 enrichments, and I say the p-value is 0.05 after I've done the bond for correction, I'm saying there's only a 5% chance that any one of these is wrong. Right? And that's and in the false discovery rate, I'm saying, I expect on average 5% of the ones I report to be wrong. So 5% of the 100, or so like 5 on average are wrong. If I just use a nominal p-value of 0.05, I don't do any correction, and I do 1,000 tests and I report 100 of them, well, actually what I expect is 50, 50 of them are wrong on average, because 50 is 5% of 1,000. Right? Yeah? Uh, what is for you the best MPR? I mean, uh, for example, in our lab, we are generating a cosmic mass spec, and we have a huge protein list, and we can choose between different, different yeah. And we never know if we have to choose 5%, 1%, 0.1%. So for you, what is the best it, it It just depends on your community. And so a lot of communities, they, a lot of communities actually use 10% FDR. 10%? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because for me, 5% is huge. 5% is good too, okay. you know. Okay. But like I said, it varies a lot from community to community. Okay, so so what I'm uh, so now I'm going to tell you how to compute the false discovery, right? And so you now I've just compared that to the bond for only correction. Now the false discovery rate, there's there's a variety of different techniques to compute it or to estimate it. Uh, the most common one by far is called the Benjamini Hochberg procedure, which is what I'm going to tell you about. And the FDL or false discovery rate is often called the Q value instead of the P value. 
OK, so how do you compute the Benjamin E. Hochberg? I mean, I, the reason I'm telling you this, like I told you how to compute the bond for only correction. And that's easy, right? You can do this in Excel. This is also something you can do in Excel if you have to. Because the tools won't necessarily do this for you, or they won't even necessarily do it right. OK, so how do you compute that? Well, so here, what I've done is these are all the, te uh, these are all the gene sets that I've tested. And this is a cartoon, meaning that I made it up. But uh, it's, it's, I made it up in such a way to illustrate the, uh, the procedure better. So let's say these are all categories and my go slim. And I've tested them. And transcription regulation is the one that's most enriched. Translational regulation is not enriched at all. Translation. And so I've taken all these categories. I've taken their nominal p-values. Those are the p-values in this case that I computed, say, using Fisher's exact test or using one of these ranked list tests. And I sorted them from smallest to largest. Right? I don't know why here it says decreasing order. Uh, I would re recommend right now you take this out and write increasing order. And because I. So, smallest to largest. Okay? Okay. And then you compute what's called the adjusted p value. So, what's the adjusted p value? You take the nominal p-value, you multiply it by the number of tests that you've done, 53, and then you divide it by the rank in this sorted list. So the first one, you multiply it by 53, you divide it by 1, and that's the adjusted p-value. The second one, you multiply by 53, and you divide by 2, and that's the adjusted value. The third one, you multiply by 53, and you divide by 3, that's the third one. Multiply by 53, divide by 4, that's the fourth one, and so forth. So just maybe, let me make a couple comments here. Number one, this p-value up here at the top of the list is just the original p-value times 53. That's the Bonferroni correction at the top of the list. Right? And then as we go down, the correction gets weaker. At the bottom of the list, I'm multiplying by 53 and dividing by 53. That's one. So at the bottom of the list, we're not making any correction to the p-value at all. So from the top of the list to the bottom of the list, the correction that we're doing to do the adjust p-value is weaker. Okay. The other thing is, is this adjusted p-value, even though the nominal p-value goes from smallest to largest, it can go up and down. So this is big, this is above 5, above 0.05, above 0.05, below 0.05, above 0.05. Now this one's 1, and then this goes down. It doesn't necessarily go up and down because you just, the correction you're doing is getting weaker and weaker. Okay. So now the q-value can be computed from this list. What the q-value is, the q-value for a given rank is the smallest p-value at that rank or above. Sorry. <laughs> I got that wrong. That was stupid. All right. The q-value... The, the q-value is... What the hell? What? What? Oh, I get it, I get it. Never mind, sorry. Um, I've been doing this for so many years, and I just completely, today is not my day, I'm a little bit tired. Okay. The Q value is the smallest P value at that rank or below. Right? The smallest adjusted P value. So you see here, for this one, the smallest adjusted P value is 0.04, and then I, you just have to believe me that everything below here is above 0.04. This, the smallest one, is 0.04. You have to believe me, again, that everything above here is 0.04. So it's 0 0.04, 0 0.04, 0 0.04, and then we get to this one, and this is now the smallest p-value at this rank or above. Right? And then you can see here the smallest p-value at this rank or above is 0.99. Got that? That's the q-value. Now you're done. You've done the Be uh, benjamin e Hochberg. It's called the step-down procedure and you compute the FDR. And it's just described there, and it's very easy to do in Excel. The most difficult thing about in Excel is like figuring out how to get this like number here, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way down for the rows. But you can figure that out. It's pretty easy. OK. And so, and then people, when they choose the FDR threshold, they choose the FDR threshold based on these Q values. Right? And so if you're going to threshold at 0.05, there's going to be a nominal p-value that's associated with that threshold. And you can just look that up on your table. 
Now one comment here, even though this number goes up and down, the suggested p-value, because this number here is the smallest p-value at that rank or below, it always goes up. Right? So you can always threshold it and be sure that you get everything that works. Okay. Yeah. Right. So in proteomics, I don't know if the quantitative um, aspect or just total aspect, how, how is that right? So, I mean, I can give you some suggestions. I'm, I don't do proteomics. Uh, I know what some of my colleagues do. But, but I mean, that, that is a really experimentally specific way of coming up with that. Like, everybody has depending upon how you're doing the measurements in the first place, how you come up with the rank depends not only on what you understand about the instrument and its measurement properties, but also the kind of question that you're asking. Are you asking for differential regulation? Or are you asking for upregulation versus downregulation? So, so in proteomics, sometimes people just, they just count the number of peptides, uh, or you know, they count the number of time, the number of unique peptides, or they count the number of peptides that show up. There's various different ways of doing this quantification. And then I can't... Strongly biased. Well, you're going to have to argue with proteomics people about how to rank lists. And this is, this is sometimes why people like coming up with gene lists instead of rank lists of genes. But you had, a, you had an answer yes. to that. Um, we are also doing proteomics. And uh, to rank the protein, uh, we are using a, actually a classical AP mass-spec approach with a base. And then we are using a control, for example, the GFP. And then we are um, putting our result in a website developed here in Toronto. With oh, and Claude. Saint, Saint yeah. Express, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Our Saint, and they, they do um, probability of interaction between the one and the zero, and it can work. So it's gave you a probability. It's not the p value, but it worked very well for us. Well, I mean, the p-value is really, I mean, it's, it gives you a way of measuring enrichment. And like we, we've seen when we, we define the rank list things, you can use it just as a score, right? And so the smaller the p-value, the higher the enrichment. And then, you know, we're going to use that score in various ways. We can use it as a way of establishing a threshold. We can use it as a way of like establishing a false discovery rate. So you can be pretty flexible. Like even though Saint, what, what it gives you is a p-value, you can use that to rank. The other nice thing about the, the work that Anne-Claude Gingras does is that she also comes up with frequent flyers. So she tells you about proteins that show up a lot uh, and that are being expressed in this cell type. And you can use that as a way of defining background for proteomics. OK, questions? All right, folks. You've done good. All right. so. So, I mean, we talked about two different ways of doing the multiple test correction. And if you're doing the form of bond Froni correction and you're testing like 10,000 gene annotation categories to get a significant p value, you're going to have to find a p value that's at least 10 to the minus 5, right? And that's a pretty small p value. So, how do you deal with that problem? Well, you can do the false discovery rate, and the false discovery rate is not always going to work, right? Because maybe still it's, you're, 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 the, the correction you need to do still depends on the number of tests that you do. So it still might be too stringent. The other way of, of approaching this problem is to be careful about what questions you ask of your data. Right? So instead of testing all 10,000 Go categories, you can just test Go Slim. So instead of asking 10,000 questions, you're only asking 100 questions. And then what you have to correct for is 100 tests instead of 10,000 tests so that the p-value that you need for significance becomes like 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 4 instead of the 10 to the minus 5 or 10 to the minus 6. All right. So, so there's various ways of choosing this. And the first thing you can't do is you can't choose what tests you're going to do after you've seen the data. Right? You have to choose the tests that you're going to do before you've seen the data. Now, that's obvious when I say it. But there's, there's ways of kind of implicitly doing this that, that are less obvious. 
So a question that I get a lot is, okay, well, I've got the data, now I have my gene list, now I just want to remove all the Go categories that don't have any hits in my gene list. Right? That, that's, that's looking at your data bef uh, to choose your tests. Because right? basically what you're saying is the overlap between my gene list and my gene set is, is zero. And then the p-value with zero overlap would be one, because you know, any random sample is going to have an overlap of zero or more. So, so you're like filtering out all the p-values that you've implicitly computed by looking for no overlap between the gene set and your gene list. So you can't do that. What you can do is after you define your background set, right, you're saying, okay, these are the genes that I think my gene list can, could have come from. Then you say, okay, well, I'm going to remove all goal categories that are neither in my gene list or in my background set. That's fair, right? Because, you know, you wouldn't be able to get enrichment for those anyways because, you know, the, you know, you'd be choosing zero balls from a, from a bin that contains zero balls. You know, uh, that's okay. So you can say, okay, we're going to remove geontology categories that don't overlap my background set or have small overlap with my background set. The other thing that, that, that uh, is good to do is, is once you define your background set, removing uh, categories that don't have a lot of genes in your background set. And when I'm saying background set, I'm including the gene list and the ones that are on your gene list in your background. Right? So if there's only ge three genes in the entire background set that are in, in this geontology category, um, when you have a small gene set, you don't get very significant p-values, right? So, so those, you know, you're not going to be able to detect enrichment of small gene sets. Um, also, something that sometimes people do is they remove gene sets that are too large, right? So, you know, um, let me take a step back and, and go back to what I was saying before, removing the small gene sets. The reason this is such a valuable, valuable, valuable thing to do is that in the gene ontology category, as Gary described, there's, it's hierarchical, right? So if you annotate in a lower level category, that annotation gets propagated up to all the upper level categories. I development is a type of, of development. So any gene in I development is also a gene that gets annotated in development. And the way that the hierarchy works is at the lowest level, there's like tens of thousands of categories that are tiny. Now, you're not going to be able to detect enrichment in these tiny categories. So if you just set a threshold and say, okay, if there's no more than 10 genes in my background list, I'm not even going to test for enrichment in that. That removes like 90, 80 to 90 percent of the gene ontology categories, just like that. Right? And it's a great thing to do because you're never going to be able to get enrichment in those, in those sets. And so what G-Profiler does which is going to be one of the methods that uh, you're, going to be, uh, you're going to be using in the lab, you can, you, can you can select cutoffs to say, okay, I'm not going to try any gene sets that have less than 10 genes in my background list, for example. And this is what we generally do in my lab. Um, now, going back to what I was saying before, sometimes categories are so broad that they're non-formative. You know, your gene is, list is enriched for development. Well, what does that tell you? It doesn't really tell you that much. So sometimes people set an upper limit in the size of the gene set that they do the tests for. That's, I, I, I used to recommend that. Now I don't think you should do it because it's just there's so few of these gene sets anyways, it doesn't make a big, uh, doesn't make a big difference. You might as well include them in your analysis. And the other, the other reason that this is, this is important is what Gary is going to talk about tomorrow. You're doing enrichment when, oh, what Gary's going to talk about later on is that when you do these enrichment analyses, often you get like dozens of gene sets and that are related to each other because of this overlap between the Go categories. So you get development is, is enriched and I development is enriched in, in, at the same time. And then, but having all these, this redundancy in these, these enriched categories helps you when you do something called enrichment maps which groups all these categories together and then defines different processes, sort of higher level processes that are going to be enriched. So my recommendation is either use something like GoSlim or remove categories that don't overlap much with your background set. So I like 10, some people use 5, some people use 3. 5 might be good, I like 5, 5 is a good number. Um, I mean really you make this, you, sh you should make these decisions based on what are called power calculations. 
um, and you can compute the uh, basically the most significant p-value that you would expect given that your gene set size is five, for example. And then you can you can quantitatively make decisions based on what the most significant p-value you could you could detect is, right? Or the most significant p-value you can expect to detect given a certain level of enrichment. Um, and that's, that's a quantitative, that's a principled way to make these, these decisions, or you can make arbitrary choices like the number five is, appeals to me. So, Okay, so questions. Uh, so we've talked about statistical tests. We've talked about two types. One just considers a gene list, and that test is called Fisher's exact test. It's the only thing you need to know about that. There's one that considers a rank list, and there's lots of things you need to know here. You need to know how to rank your genes, and then you have to choose what type of test that you use. The tests are basically all the same thing in that, or there's basically two types. There's the minimum hypergeometric test and GSCA test, and these are Kolmogorinov or KS style tests. And basically they, they look for maximum enrichment. You can think of it as, as choosing the most enriched gene set, sorry, the most enriched gene list. Right? And then there's another type of test which is just like a t-test applied to ranks. And I didn't talk about that. And then once you've done your statistical testing and computed nominal p-values, if you're testing more than one hypothesis or more than one gene set, you have to do a multiple test correction. You can do the Bonferroni, which control controls the probability of at least one false positive, and you just multiply that by the number of tests. Or you can do the FDR q-value, which controls the pro expected proportion of false positives. And this typically uses the benjamini hochberg procedure, which is what I taught you. Okay, so these are the learning objectives. Hopefully we've satisfied all of them. Certainly.